natural thing to do. For, for Raman peak, small in the to red side, smaller wave numbers, as increased temperature. But I was a little bit reluctant to publish because what I knew is that in graphene, the in-plane light is constant, actually shrinks as you heat it up. So the, it's, it's, of course, reverse trend from what you see in normal materials. And the reason why is that, is that you can view it, uh, so this is graphene plane. If you increase temperature, you have this out-of-plane vibrations. When you have out-of-plane vibrations, you're kind of pulling atoms in plane together, right? I think it was also called like a Lifshitz membrane or something like that effect. And because of that, if you have a shrinkage in, in plane direction, that should normally go to the blue side. So it should be uh, uh, shifting to higher wave numbers. So that kind of puzzled me for, for a while, and, and that's why in our nanoletter, which we published, I was very careful kind of going around this thing, uh, not very brave. And also we, we observed that the uh, widths of the Raman peaks do not follow whatever is supposed to be simple model. Again, that's why we put that we did not observe dependence of the uh, widths within the experimental uncertainty, blah, blah, blah. But then after it was published, I went to a conference in uh, Boston for MRS meeting. And right before me was a talk from uh, Banini, uh, who is uh, from... Uh, what's it? Marzani, I think his last name. So it's all, all Italian group in MIT, but now the professor moved to Cambridge. And what they did, the calculation for frequency shift in graphene with temperature, and they did some uh, uh, ab initio sort of DFT calculation. And what they saw, uh, what they found, that if you just take into account lattice expansion, then the G peak do, should indeed uh, switch to higher wave numbers. But if you take into account all the possible interaction, including due to harmonicity, including three phonons, four phonons, etc., then there would be a reverse trend. So the peak will still be shifting to the red side. That kind of gave us confidence that, and they had a comparison with our experiment. So that gave us confidence that what we are measuring is indeed resulting from the local heating which we produce. I mean, okay, from the heating we produce, not local though. And so it is a good metric to, to measure the temperature. So now, when we did these measurements, I thought uh, to make, uh, clarify one point, which is important. We intentionally use very low excitation power of the laser, so that we don't produce local heating. But instead, we change the temperature uh, of the setup externally. All right? So that kind of gives us calibration curve. Now, I, I have to switch something. So now let's uh, go to thermal conductivity. And this is very uh, related to what we just did. Because the idea of strong dependence of GPIC position from temperature leads to the idea of using Raman spectrometer as a thermometer. Okay? And then the whole experimental thing goes like this. So if you manage to uh, suspend a graphene flake over trench, and then you do laser heating here in the middle of graphene flake, but now intentionally you start increasing this power so that you are producing local heating in this spot. And then by the position of G-peak, you can see what is the local temperature rise in response to this power. And if you know how much, what fraction of power dissipates in graphene compared to whatever is reflected back, then you can tell everything. You can tell what's the thermal conductivity of this material uh, in this given range. So now, but before I go to this, let me remind you some basics of heat conduction. So, the thermal conductivity is coefficient in the Fourier law, which you probably heard, right? The Fourier law. And heat in materials could be conducted by two entities. It can be conducted by electrons, if I, and if it's the metal, that's the case. It can be also conducted by lattice vibrations or phonons. Okay? Electronic part of thermal conductivity is relatively straightforward to figure out. You can always figure out it from Widemer's France law, right? And if you know the electrical conductivity, you can figure out what's electronic contribution to thermal conductivity. A phonon part is more difficult. Now, just to give you some ideas of the scale of this value. So thermal conductivity of silicon is around 150 watt per meter per Kelvin near room temperature. Silicon oxide is about 10 times or 100 times less. Copper bulk value is about 400, okay? But if you go to copper interconnects, it will drop down if you have a very tiny wire. So now, the thermal conductivity of carbon materials is particularly peculiar. For the diamond, you have the highest value of all solids in, in nature. So it goes to up to 2,200 watt per meter Kelvin. 
Graphite also has pretty high value in plane because you have strong covalent sp2 bonding in plane, so it can conduct it very well, but low value cross plane. For diamond-like carbon, this material which is used for as protective co uh, coating for all discs, DVR, DVD, whatever, it's, it's small, okay? And CNTs, carbon nanotubes, were reported to have values, very wide range of values, from 1,000 to 7,000, but mostly people believe Philip Kim's value and Eric Pope's value, which are from 3,000 to 3,500, okay? So there's very wide range, and it's not clear where graphene would fall. From one side, it's close to uh, carbon nanotubes, but from the other side, diamond-like carbon, when it's, you thin it down, uh, it has very low value. Now, again, because it's electrical engineering colloquium, the next question we have to ask, why should we worry about thermal conductivity at all? Uh, for a number of years, electrical engineers were not too much concerned with that, with the exception of some packaging uh, engineers in industry. Well, the reason why you should get worried about it, because now, thermal effects, self-heating, and thermal management are the showstoppers for continuous downscaling in electron device feature size and continuous increase in integration density. So, five years ago, when you were buying a laptop or a new desktop, the advertisement would necessarily tell you about increased frequency, right? But it's not happening anymore. Why? Because with each new increased frequency, with each new this Pentium mode, you always have this increase in the thermal design power. Some sort of average power which has to be dissipated from, from the chip, okay? Since they couldn't continue this trend anymore, it was already very high, they went to multi-core designs. So now you have just double CPU or whatever CPUs. So by going to multi-core designs, you somehow elevate, you know, eliminate the problem of uh, a DTP. But there's another problem which is still there, and it's also an important problem. It's non-uniform power density inside the chip which lead to hot spots. And these hot spots uh, you know, lead to de degradation, breaking down, etc., etc. And the problem of hot spots cannot be solved by putting a bigger fan. Okay? That's why you have to come up with some sort of design solution early at materials or device uh, stage. So you have to take into account thermal constraints consideration to all this chip design efforts now. So that's why there is a growing interest to thermal issues in, in semiconductor materials and other materials. On top of all that, if you go to nanoscale geometries, the, just the ability of material to conduct heat deteriorates in most of cases. So this is uh, some old paper which my first graduate student here at UCR did, Jizu. Uh, so she calculated thermal conductivity of silicon nanowire when you go from bulk to silicon nanowire. And her calculation was prediction 13 watt per meter Kelvin for 20 nanometers, uh, diameter nanowire. Accidentally, two years afterward, Berkeley Group measured it, and they measured about nine. So it was a nice coincidence. But so what it tells you is that if you try to design nanowire FET or like fin fed or whatever, you also have to take into account, you have to also remember that thermal conductivity of silicon is no longer 150. It's much closer to 1.5 or like a 5, okay? And the reason for that mostly comes from the phonon boundary scattering. Because acoustic phonons, these are the heat carriers in semiconductor devices. And their um, mean free pass, according to the Dubai model, at near room temperature is about uh, 40, 50 nanometers. Okay? So it's pretty large at room temperature. So if you go to feature sizes which are below 50 nanometers, so you have now a lot of phonon boundary scattering, and that really kills the thermal conductivity. So for that reason, uh, so that's a just fundamental physics problem. You have to look at uh, you know, what other materials around which can have pretty high thermal conductivity and use them for design or try to incorporate them into the chip design. And in, in this sense, so graphene was of interest. And I think the first time I discussed a measurement with, with Andre Ferrari was like in 2007, but then I figured out that, well, it's probably useless. You cannot measure thermal conductivity of something with atomic thickness. Because the measurement principle, so you have to have your object, so you have to apply temperature gradient, uh, you know, figure out how much power you're putting here, and, and then get geometry right and uh, uh, figure out some activity. And then instruments which I have in my lab, so I have pretty much wide selection for all cases except for graphene. So I have a trend, you know, I have hard disk, uh, laser flash, 3 omega, which was built uh, here, 
but they all do not work for graphene because mostly uh, the 3 omega, which is for thin film, uh, you need to have most of temperature drop across the film, and it's mostly like for cross plane. Uh, but then, after we had this uh, temperature dependent Raman studies, we thought, okay, we can use this geometry, and even if the thermal activity is very high, because cross section is small and the heat has nowhere to escape, we can uh, measure thermal conductivity. Okay, the time is really running up. Uh, so let me just say, so this is how suspended the small later work of flakes, graphene flakes look like. So this was done by Jahid. Uh, and so this is trench, and this is bilayer, three-layer graphene flake along this trench. So it looks pretty nice. And the measurement would be G peak position as a function of power we are putting in. So what happens, we figure out, we, we did the measurement, and here's the values for thermal conductivity of graphene, and, and here all other carbon materials. And so what we found first was kind of surprising. So we got very high value for long flakes, which were suspended, not strong carbon to substrate, from 3,000 to 5,000. So it's on the kind of high end of uh, whatever people reported for carbon nanotubes. But then immediately there is a question. Can it be the case if, let's say, if you have bulk graphite, it has in-plane value of 2,000, so the phonon group velocities are similar, okay? So why would you have higher than bulk value of thermal conductivity, okay, for two-dimensional crystal? And, and again, it was puzzling for some time, and, but again, what measured is measured. Uh, that was the follow-up work now. I, I, I first report results. So the most notable work uh, was in uh, UT Austin, when they had single layer graphene supported on substrate, a single CVD grown graphene, it's a different quality. They had 6,000, oh, 600, I'm sorry. And they also did their own calculation, which differs from our calculation, and they obtained 3,000, which is also above the bulk value. And they attributed this reduction to substrate coupling. But they still came up with a positive message saying, well, this is still much higher than copper. And it's only one atomic layer. So if you have more layers, you may have less deterioration. Then they also did suspended, and they got value which is also above bulk graphite limit. And those are other measurements, which I, 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 I don't want to go into much. But now, so there's still a puzzling question. Uh, why you can have larger value of thermal conductivity for two-dimensional crystal if dispersion is similar, phonon group velocities are similar? And here I have to a little bit go into physics, and but it's really exciting physics. So it turns out that, let's say, how it goes in bulk, in bulk crystals. So you start with harmonic approximation. You calculate on the dispersion, right? But if crystal, three-dimensional crystal, is harmonic, then thermal conductivity is infinity. If it's ideal crystal, no defects. Because phonons do not see each other, no interaction, so they, you don't establish equilibrium. So you have to introduce unharmonicity, so high order terms, in order to have phonons see each other, interact with each other, you know, as described by on-club scattering, and then you have finite thermal conductivity of crystal, three-dimensional crystal, and it scales down as 1 over T, T is the temperature, near room temperature, and that's manifestation of unharmonicity of crystal, okay? Now, there is an interesting statement. If you go to two-dimensional crystal, and you have the same crystal, it's unharmonic, so there is unharmonicity, but thermal conductivity of this two-dimensional crystal will be infinite. So, having unharmonicity in two-dimensional crystal is not sufficient to have finite thermal conductivity. In this sense, uh, you cannot talk about intrinsic thermal conductivity of two-dimensional crystal unless you specify its size, because thermal conductivity has logarithmic divergence with size of the system in two-dimensional case. Okay? And there are a bunch of theorists in hardcore physics guys who are working on it, and the way they do, some of them computational methods, some of them analytical, so they just set up a huge crystal, put in harmonicity, in some, pick some potential and do simulation, and they never get finite value, okay? So it, it does not converge in two-dimensional crystals, okay? So that's an interesting point. In order to have finite value, you either have to have a finite size, or you have to throw in some imperfections, defects, disorder, and, and whatever else you always have in real life, okay? So in this sense, you can have higher value of thermal conductivity in two-dimensional crystal. Now, of course, it is, it's beautiful, but people were demanding me, okay, this is all too, too much physics. Explain us in the simple terms how it's possible. Do I still have how much time? Yeah, yeah, okay. 